Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, politics, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve every aspect of your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a national leader in political journalism. He currently serves as the associate editor of the Daily Mirror and is highly regarded for his ability to find the truth amongst political pandering. Throughout his long and illustrious career in political journalism, he has worked on the Western Morning News, The Daily Telegraph, The Guardian, Sky News, the BBC, and even the political powerhouse that is New Civil Engineer. When he isn't shedding light into the darkness of the political system, he serves as a board member for the National Advisory Panel, as well as a board contributor for the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. Luckily, for the sake of this podcast's entertainment value, he is not a part of the awkward squad, a term he coined that reached national recognition in the early part of the century. Kevin Maguire, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Great, Paul. Great to be here. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you. I've been a fan for a long time. Um, you were one of six t- children brought up in South Shields. Yeah. Your dad was a coal miner and your mum worked in a biscuit factory. Was humour at the heart of everything and valued in your family? It, it was more my mum's side than my, my dad's. You know, like he and his mates down the pit, uh, you know, they always made light of, uh, you know, of struggles and danger and risks and everything. But my mum kept the family together, brought us up, and she just had lots of funny little little scenes. You know. Money was short, but I'd never pretend I was brought up in poverty, but money was short, it was tight, you'd get the end of the week and there'd be no meat, no need to get a small violin out, or, you know, you'd, you'd have trousers that were patched or had holes in, the, you know, same with, uh, with, with shoes, but, you know, it was, it was quite a contented childhood, but she would say things like, she hated meanies, she hated tight people, and uh, she would say, yeah, a shroud's got no pockets, you can't take it with you, you know, the graveyard's full of rich people, you've got to spend it now. And I think that that was it. I think I got, I think I got it from her. And it's kind of you, know, you just make you make light. You know, it's not quite laughing in the face of adversity, but you just make light of of hardship and trouble. It's interesting because my mum's from the East End of Glasgow, where you know poverty was rife as well. But it, it's interesting that you said about your, that your mum and hated tightness. And my, the funny thing is that the, the English talk about the Scots as being tight, but they're the most generous people you yeah. can meet, especially Glaswegians. And my mum, who is 92, will still fight you to buy a, a, a drink or, or pay the bill. Yeah. Because God, it's a matter of pride. I don't, my mum's 92 as well. Maybe we were just, you know, they, they were separated at birth, you know. So like well, twins, uh, isn't it? Twins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which one would be the female Arnie Schwarzenegger and the other female uh, Danny DeVito. But, no, well, yeah. <laughs> but there is, like, you know, it's a, it's a generosity of spirit, though. And, yeah. you know, you, you, you haven't got a lot, but there's no point complaining, uh, going around all the time, being a fun sponge, you know, just thinking life is utterly miserable. It's much better lived with a, you know, a smile on your face and a, and a, and a laugh, you know, that, that people can hear. And there is, you're right, it's a generosity spirit. I think this, this idea, Scots are tight, there's a kind of underlining, you know, there's some minor races I'm not going to, not going to get to, but, you know, the, the, that stereotyping, doing people down, I've, I've never found Scots. You know, tight. I mean, you know, Dad's army had uh, what Fraser, who you know, was counting his money and uh, and so on. He, you know, he, he had to play, he had to play that role. But no, nah, it's not. You know, like, working class people are the most generous, and you see that in charitable donations. And if you do, what proportion of your income do you give? That people who are on very little give a much bigger proportion than you know, flash sods with loads of cash who you know want wings of hospitals uh, named after them. And. Uh, 
and also uh, uh, we pay our tax as well. <laughs> <laughs> Great, right into the politics. Mm. That's uh, well. I I was fascinated by your mum, and uh, we are a, a similar age, and and both I think Virgos born. Yeah. In, Two yeah. days apart. I'm the 18th of September. I think you're the 20th. I am. It's always been a bit of slight source of an embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 60 year old virgin. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Why, can, why couldn't it be a Pisces or yeah, <laughs> something like that? Yeah. Uh, but it, your mum, uh, I loved her phrase you're better than nobody and nobody's better than you. Yeah. I mean, how much did that actually seep in? Because to get to where you are now, that seems like a hell of a leap and a hell of a journey. Yeah, I'd have preferred it if she said, nobody's better than you, you're better than nobody. I would have preferred the, the emphasis that way, but, uh, but it never was. But I think she never liked people who were too big for their boots. Uh, you know, people who, who could be rude, you know, politeness costs uh, nothing was another, uh, just, you know, just a way of life for, for her. And um, I, think I've, I think I've tried to take it through. That doesn't mean uh, I don't lose my rag sometimes. Um, you know, I can, I can be short, you know, when you're tired, when you're stressed and like that. But we, yeah, we live in a, a community, a society, and it's better if we try to get on. That's not the ignore points of difference or uh, people behaving badly and pointing that out but it's it's just that it's it's like rubbing along try and rub along with other people and I think that's not a bad way of seeing life because you know there are some people that are incredibly entitled and they're they're a pain in the arse as as a result yeah and you can they are the people that uh, you want to bring down actually or have a go at always punch up never down Oh, no. Well, uh, well, it's, it's the Humorology podcast. And one, one of the rules, I think, my background is comedy store and all yeah. that. And uh, we started in, in the 80s with no racist, no sexist uh, mm. uh, material, but also the idea that you punched up, you didn't punch yeah. down, which was uh, at, uh, at the time, if you remember, with Bernard Manning and... Um, Who's the Nick Nick guy, whatever he was called? Um, yeah. um, Jim it, Davidson. It, Jim Davidson. Yeah. Well, there's there. very bitter man. Very bitter. Met him a few yeah. times. Uh, used to used to see him hanging around the margins of Tory party conferences. Uh, he was he was just just a, you know, a sad git really. Well, yeah, I I did uh, a couple of live gigs like the you know live from Her Majesty's with him, and I I would agree. Even uh, then, he was bitter, and and I think it's about attitude, isn't it? About yeah. seeing the best in people or the worst, and it just seems that his uh, his microscope is is looking for bad in everything. Yeah, and then that's stone real divisions between between people. It's a kind of a, it's a it's a right wing way of you know, dividing and uh, and ruling on the left we're supposed to look for solidarity we don't always but nevertheless it's a it's a it's a better it's a better approach even if it's uh sometimes uh ob observed in the uh you know the absence of it um but now he's that's right he's he's just unpleasant his views are unpleasant and that's well it. but but they are they are becoming it would seem more prevalent in in some parts of the media you said once yeah. populism is the politics of promises and it often turns into the politics of apologies now populism often uh, revolves around grand pledges uh, can humor be an antidote to populism it, it can if it as long as you get the right Target you know, the right, you know, the right victim, and if you know the stupidity of racists, uh, for, for instance, is is good rather than making jokes that are racist. Uh, so you you can you can use it. You can win you can win people over with a bit of humour and and showing the absurdity sometimes of of their views without ramming it too hard down their throat because nobody likes to be made to feel or look stupid or be called stupid. Uh, I get that. Um, Certainly, but no, no, humor is a very, very powerful weapon. You see it with the better, the better politicians. Because I'm, I work now in the, uh, you know, the House of Commons in Parliament. Uh, rub shoulders with them. Some you like, some you don't. Um, but people like uh, Dennis Skinner, no longer an MP, the beast of all's over. 
But he was oh, yeah. just so sharp with his humour, and he knew he could be scathing and make a really political point, and the Tories would hate it. Yeah, you know, there's that uh, that that tale he was told he couldn't. He said half the uh, you know half the Tories are liar, uh, liars, and it's because you can't do that. You're saying, all right, then half the Tories aren't liars. <laughs> and then it was, I I helped him write a book, and he was just so sharp. And this was a yeah, you know, this was a lad who was born 1932. I think he was one of nine kids. His dad had been blacklisted. He was a coal miner. Uh, had been blacklisted since the 1926 general strike. Uh, and his mum um, took in uh, took in took in washing. He was formidably bright. If he'd have been born in a middle class family, uh, it'd be a, it'd have been a, a you know a QC a KC a, a top barrister, or it could have been an actor, which he said he would have liked. Uh, to have been, but he wasn't. He went. He went down the pit. Went into politics, and you know, that was to the benefit of uh, of, of his community in Bolsover, and I, I would argue, argue Britain. But he just knew how to use uh, humour because he would say, you know, uh, in, in a speech, make make them laugh, make them cry. He, you know, he knew if you if you got somebody laughing and smiling, uh, he could get them on you know, his side and, and against those he was was targeting. Well, which is uh, about getting to people's emotions, isn't yeah. it? And uh, through and using humour as that vehicle through. We had Rick Wilson on the podcast, you know, the Lincoln Project yeah. in America, mm -hmm. yeah. which uh, effectively uses humour. And it did seem to cut through and, and have a thing. But then uh, we had John O'Farrell. Do you know John? Yeah, um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and John came up with an interesting theory, which I'd be interested to hear what you think about he said I'm worried now because obviously John worked on have I got news and spitting image and and he said people now think they've done the job by tweeting something funny so there's less people you know in on the streets now because like I've shown my colors yeah. I've told the government because I I did a meme uh, yeah. and and a thing do you think that's true and and this meme culture is prevalent uh, do you think that's enough and and has it stopped people really marching and 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 protesting yeah very funny guy uh, john and very perceptive i remember yeah, he was uh, re reading his book uh, around the time of the 1997 uh, general election in fact i've got it somewhere you know, in, in the my best final... a man the best a man could get or the um it was the no, other one that. um it wasn't <laughs> It wasn't things can only get better because that's dream and it. This is terrible. I've read. I've read his book. No, it, it was called things can only get better. Was it? Wasn't oh, it? actually, I think so. Yeah, he took it from that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we are. We're, we're, I think we're both sounding more like our mum's ages now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> it's like groping around with a bit of information, but but I think he's right. I think look, Twitter, social media is is good for information. People linking up. But you know, I see somebody on sale that has got so many retweets uh, on Twitter, and what X as it's called now, uh, by Elon Musk, um, or so many people have clicked on a, a petition. I think it actually counts for very little at the end of the, end of the day. And uh, I must admit, I, I sometimes think their tactics can backfire a little, but uh, I admire the just stop oil protesters who aren't just there sending, uh, sending emails and... Uh, you know, little quips or facts on uh, on social media there you know they get they're getting out there and getting public attention and I, I think you know it's almost if it's all just social media at least joke you know on on Facebook how many friends you got how many real friends have you got you, know, you might have a lot of friends on Facebook but you haven't got any real friends it? it's the atomization in some ways I know it connects us all but it's just everybody with their phones or their laptops or whatever and it's not the same as, as meeting physically somewhere and chatting and talking and planning and it's you know going going on a big demonstration i'm not i'm not one for for lots of marches many because they're on saturdays uh, often and i like to go to the football or the rugby um <laughs> instead but i do see the i do see the value of, of people getting to get together and if this you know this click activism is uh, you're becoming a diversion that is that's a that's a problem that's a problem for society people all just do their own things sitting at home rather than getting together well yeah i i think so as well i think it's you know uh, it just feels like i think 
John is right, that if you, uh, you've you gone, I've satisfied that urge, rather than properly writing to your MP or properly yeah. mm. going and, uh, and getting out on the street. Mm. Everybody wants to do things fast now. And I get, you know, there's some great thing people doing, you know, best for Britain or whatever it is to get people to do it. But I wonder, you're in the heart of politics, do MPs and governments take any notice uh, we got 50,000 people who did this online click petition does it make any difference no no they don't want that you know what they, they notice is if you're a constituent and you, you you write to them you can do it the old way if you like get your pen out a bit of paper you know do it as an, an envelope stamp post it or if you if you send an email they'll take notes of that and if they're beginning to get lots on a subject they will take note of that now if you just send the standard response here it is you know can everyone just send this to their mp you yeah. tighter rules on your know, laws on fox hunting or more money on it whatever they tend to disregard those because they just see that no one's made the effort but if you've sat and typed something original they will take note of that and they do because they say mm, you know, i've had a lot on uh, a lot on this a lot on that i mean you hear them talk all the time and just ask them uh, and they, they will they will know that so you know they're, they're not re they're not remote most of them want no. to win their seat again and, and most of them of all political parties actually work quite hard it's got to be got to be said much to my annoyance i like those on the right to work a lot less hard but uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> rough too <laughs> Well, but but going back to the point, uh, can it actually humour be a proper antidote to um, populism? Or is it just, you know, I mean, it just doesn't seem to be cutting through as much as, you know, all these new channels coming up, which, you know, GB News and all those, uh, not renowned for its humour, no. as far as I can see. Well, not its um, intentional humour. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Some of the presenters are pretty ropey when you see it. Well, yeah. Did you see that bit uh, the other day where the, that they had the breaking news? And was it Martin Daubry? Yeah. I don't want to drag him through the mud for the sake of it, but it was, there was a lot of difference between a professional uh, anchor from any channel who gets some breaking news and what happened there. Yeah, I mean, look, if you do TV, you're going to have some bad days, but that was, that was so bad. I mean, it was it was kind of like Anchorman, you know. Uh, doesn't it? I mean, as if if you scripted it to go wrong like that, you, you'd have probably had exactly as it is. You know, sometimes uh, fact is funnier than fiction. But, uh, no, it's uh, but I, I, I do I do think I do think humour is a powerful powerful weapon. Um, it's you know, got to get it right, got to get it the appropriate time. But uh, I think I think it's good. You can we can send up politicians. Aren't you? you think in the end, D David Steele used to be the leader of the Liberals. He was in an alliance with David Owen of the SDP, and he used to have him in his, his uh, I think, he used to put David Steele in David Owen's pocket and make them look really small. And that really yeah. worked against him. While, say, Spit and Image had Norman Tebbett, who was a very hardline reactionary Thatcherite uh, minister, and they, they had him as the um, Chingford Skinhead, uh, Chingford being his seat. And actually that worked in his favour because that was the image he wanted to, to project that he was tough and the part of the Tory party, going through into the, you know, the work, working class Tory voters. That's, what, that's how they wanted to see him. So you know, the, hu the humour there, if it was intended to undermine Ted, but that backfired. Yeah, well, I think it backfired on Margaret Thatcher's puppet as well. I think she was seen as strong. Yeah, but you know, it, it, it's a very it, it's a very dangerous road the humour thing because you think you're insulting somebody. You know, now we go back to you know till death us do part and Warren Mitchell and Alf Garnett. Yeah, you know, that's right. That what premise? Yeah, Warren Mitchell thought he was sending up the Alf Garner racist figure but in fact he made him a, a street hero 
Uh, well, no, that was you know, the, the people. The people I heard talking about uh, Alf gone. It were you know, he was a role model. <laughs> he was somebody they aspired to be. I'm just thinking, no, no, this has all gone horribly wrong. Warren Mitchell was a gentle Jewish man. Yeah, who was uh, in league with Johnny Spate, who wrote it, who was you know a, a, a brilliant working class man. Yeah, who, who and they were sure that they were doing it but they were doing it on an intellectual level yeah actually maybe that's one of the things about populism is it you know the 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 old saying of nobody ever got poor underestimating the public's intelligence is that I, not true um yes and <laughs> yes and no as you know people yeah you know, pe people aren't by and large daft and, uh, and I, I look at uh, we, why, why have people voted or we take up whatever position, and you can you can normally find a reason for it. Look, I, look, I think I think Brexit is not a, a disaster. It was always going to be another disaster, but I could see why some people in my hometown, South Shields, North of England, uh, voted for it. I think they'll vote against their own self interest and, um, and and got it wrong, but they were just fed up. Of being ignored and you know, getting the you know, the bad end of the stick, uh, and they they wanted to punish David Cameron and George Osborne and you know old Beery Nigel Farage and uh, uh, posh idiot uh, Boris Johnson just uh, with with their vehicles to do it with, and they they prefer they prefer them to Osborne and, and Cameron. And, you know, they're going to pay, they'll pay a price for it. They probably are. I mean, I know, I know, I got a mate, uh, Millie the Brexit plumber, who voted for uh, you know, for Brexit. Never thought he'd win, but he was just he was just cheesed off. He, he regrets it now. He does after a few pints anyway, and uh, <laughs> get shy. Um, but I could, but I could see why. For instance, people, you know, I would say made a bad call. Uh, but you know what? what were they daft to do it? Well, not when they felt empowered, not when they felt they were making you know, a political class sit up and listen and take uh, you know, take notice of them and suffer well, a punishment beam. Well, for, from a humorology point of view, I, I, I they told a better story. It was yeah. filled with lies, but they they told the narrative was much better, yeah. and. Uh, it was emotional. We just talked about emotional. Uh, it had emotional resonance to uh, to people. So I, I I get it from that sense. My my concern is that from a psychological perspective, once people have made their decisions, it's very hard for them to backtrack. You, yeah. you know, like Millie, Millie the plumber. It, it everything you said. You know, yeah, that needs a few points before. <laughs> he'll admit it mm -hmm. but that's i mean it takes a lot for that shift to happen you know oh it does us... yeah it, it does with us all isn't it? You, you kind of you know, yes you, you kind of you, you got a position you think that's that's it and then you might you know you, you might change it later but some, sometimes it's a you know it's, it's, it's evolutionary other times it's revolutionary and and suddenly but you, you you talk you talk about the, the positions yeah i mean look very few people went to bed uh whistling ode, ode de joy and uh you know lying you know under a, a blue duvet with gold stars and they you know, the campaign to stay in the european union had to had to, had to def, you know, defend the warts and all while you could offer anything you know sort of el dorado when you uh, were believing uh, take back control 350 million quid a week by the nhs all you know all that nonsense uh, uh, and of course lower lower net migration which is now at a record level of more than 600,000 uh, since brexit but that's you know something else but, you know, but they could they could pro they could promise the earth they couldn't deliver any of it because most of it was made up or just impractical yeah. but they you know they did they had a better story uh, I, I looked at their campaigns and I was looking at the campaign to stay in and I thought, oh, God, blimey. It's not your quote, but I've heard you use it a few times. Uh, politics is show business for ugly people. Yeah. Um, um, in your experience, how has the blending of politics and entertainment shaped public perception? 
because it really has blended a lot uh, in the past few years, don't you think? Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, B Boris Johnson came across as a, you know, a, a fun, you know, bumbling, bumbling guy, didn't he? And he, and he, and he played it brilliantly. I've known him for 30 odd years. I, I would never trust him. I think Max Hastings, who was uh, his editor at the uh, Daily Telegraph, mine too, said you'd never trust him with your wallet or your wife. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> That, that that was the case but you what you watched him use humor uh and and people would fall for it and yeah i thought hang on just just ruffling your hair speaking a bit of greek uh and, and being daft i thought that if he was working class with a northern accent he'd have been considered an idiot and somehow a deference meant the old Etonian got away with it uh and that, that would that was you know it used to anger me uh you know he get incredibly frustrated at it i was, I'd see journalists who should have known better falling for it because, because he'd been a journalist, he knew who they were, and he'd use his first name and they, you know, they, they would just like it. Uh, you, often see, you often see a prime minister call somebody by their first name and they feel important. I mean, look, look, it's, a, it's an old trick by politicians. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't fall for it. I was talking to Mark Thomas, the comedian Mark Thomas, yeah. and he said to me, uh, uh, recently, and I just loved the line, he said, following Boris Johnson's premiership, we have less international standing than a bag of Haribo. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he's got, I've got, one of, got one of his books here somewhere. I think it's when he walked, uh, he walked, the, well, uh, he walked the security f uh, wall and fence in. Uh, that's a, in this, uh, yeah. It's a brilliant book. And by the way, um, we'll get together at the football um, uh, sometimes because he, uh, he's he's a season ticket holder as well. So, well, AFC uh, Wimbledon? Yeah. I didn't know. Half time. We always go uh, go and have a cup of tea together uh, and, and chat. I've known him forever because we yeah. started at the comedy store. But you talked about Eaton and uh, in your book, Bad Boys and all, all the public school stuff um, that... that uh, for our listeners, and we've talked about this, is 20 of our last 55 prime ministers went to Eton, which is as remarkable as it is tragic, I think. Um, uh, but you delved into that book uh, in Bad Boys into private schools. How do you use humour, if you like, to shed light on serious societal issues like that? Yeah, inequality, mate. <laughs> Make, making fun of it, uh, Pope, but you know, I, th I think you know that those who are very powerful and very, very wealthy, uh, they they want deference. Show them no deference. Mock them. Be be scathing. Show why they are actually no better than anybody else, but uh, are, are very fortunate, very privileged, even if they don't acknowledge it or or want to show it. They just want to pretend to be like uh, somebody else. So no, you just you just make fun of them uh or attempt to make fun of them anyway that way because it, it it can strip them bare and that's it but, but they you know they want them to stick around them so you, you've got to take that away and show but, but then somebody like boris johnson it, he seemed uh, impervious to that uh, that taking the piss i mean yeah. i thought uh, from a, a a humor point of view he had that in inverted commas, lightness of touch, whereby nothing seemed to uh, have him, you know. He, he had no shame. Uh, That's it. He had absolutely zero. You could catch him lying through, you know, through, you know, through his back teeth, and he, he would just, just move on, shrug, and off you go. Most people aren't like that. He, in some ways, he was a one-off, an, aber an aberration, uh, a kind of, you know, mini Trump. For, uh, for for Britain, uh, you know, we got Brexit. The states got uh, you know got got Trump insurrection. I know, I know. <laughs> um, blimey, um, give Johnson his due. I don't think he would have. <laughs> I don't think he'd have defied a, a general election <laughs> result and uh, called on people to march on uh, Parliament to, uh, in that in that way. But he he was. It's it's it was very difficult because you're right. He was impervious, but in the end. In the end, it began. You know, it, it, it eroded his authority, uh, and it began to fall apart. I mean, party gear was it? And that's you know, he, he just lied, which was his usual response to everything. Then, of course, you had that, um, you know, the the old Chris Pincher, the uh, the bottom pincher, uh, the you know, the drunken rampage, and you know, in a 
club. And that is they've been made deputy chief whip and charging for their M, Tory MP. So you know they they brought him down. But even you know they they tolerated and I think they knew they had a pact with the devil when they made him leader, but they thought he'd win them a general election, which he did with a handsome seat majority. Um, but it, it it took longer than it should have to, to uh, you know to bring him down. And then they got but what, Liz Truss, but there we are. <laughs> that went well as well, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, she, she has zero uh, sense of humour. Because she's complained about the Daily Star, of course, had that uh, lettuce, which will last longer. Liz Truss had the lettuce, and the lettuce won in the end. And she just didn't That's see it. the funny side of it uh, at all. That. Yeah, I mean, even, even, if she, even if she didn't find it particularly funny and it was hurtful, you would have thought, just try and laugh it off. Um, well, she, she well, well, that's uh, that's interesting. Do you think that self-deprecation and a sense of humour is is essential, not just to politics, but to anybody who's in a leadership role? Yeah. And and do you do you think everybody has that? Because you're saying um, Liz Trust, in your opinion, didn't have that. No, I, I don't think everybody has it, but I think people like it. When you you, know, you, can, you you can take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself over seriously. And if you can laugh at yourself and allow other people to laugh at you, then I, I think you know you, you're you're a warmer you're a warmer leader. And I think you'll take uh, people with you as a, as a as a result. You don't want people you living and working in fear of you. You want them to. <sighs> You know, to to have a link, uh, you know, an emotional attachment, and you'll inspire them more by that. Not not all bosses do, but I think the best the best bosses will laugh at themselves. And 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 do you think that that is important to create a bond? Is that ability? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, abs no, absolutely. If you if you've got a workplace, and uh, I've, I've 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 worked in many many newsrooms, some some happier than others. But if you've got an incredibly austere atmosphere, people don't want to go to work. They're living in fear of somebody flying off a handle, giving them a bollocking, uh, you know, uh, shouting them out. They don't want to go. You don't work better. If you if it's a if it's a place you think look, uh, you know, people have got smiles on their faces rather than frowns, you'll go to work and you'll be happier, and you'll be more productive. It's just I've just seen it time after time in in, in newsrooms, and I'm you know, I'm kind of you know. I mean the you know, the the executive boss class uh, cheering at the mirror. I'm not you know I'm not the top. But when I edit the paper, I always just I want everybody to be happy and enjoying it. Uh, and I know they'll work better as a result. They'll, they'll they'll write better. They'll make better decisions. They'll get better pictures. They'll design the paper better. You just you just feel it. You're a, you're empowering people. That's what you are. You're empowering them, and you and you you do that with a bit of the humor. And sometimes. You know, it can be a, a, a very grim story, and you can you know you can puncture the tension with a little a little quip. It's not you know not making fun of people dead or anything like that. But you're just you know it's it's the atmosphere. You know how do we get this paper out? You know whatever you 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 just it's just a nicer atmosphere, isn't it? It's just it's quite simple. I just never understood people who go in uh, go into work. Maybe maybe they're not inadequate when they go in. And they just want to lay down the law. They don't want any you know, any dialogue, discussion, real conversation. They want everybody just to have their heads down, you know, tapping away. No joy, no creativity. It just stands to reason, that, doesn't it? I, lo I love that idea of no joy, no creativity, because I think there is a, a, a huge correlation between creativity when people are allowed to uh, to to go with that that feeling as well yeah. why do you think on the converse of that why do you think people fail to be funny i know you you, you wonder you, you wonder if they had bad experiences uh are they inadequate uh, trouble at home uh something in their dna uh you know health problems whatever or or, or maybe some people just aren't funny and they just you know I think the funny thing is, I as I was saying that, I think what, a word that came to me is that listening. I think in order to be funny, 
you have to be good at listening. Yeah. And I, I don't just mean with the ears. I mean, you know, looking at people's faces, how are they reacting? Yeah. And, you know, when you were saying earlier, we need people in a room to uh, interact and to do those things. This is all very nice over, you know, Zoom. Yeah. But in a room, when we've been in a room together, we have more of a laugh. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I. You know, I'd like to I'd like to have been able to be there with you today. Um, on a Wednesday night, I review the papers on Sky it's to do with Tory boy Pierce, uh, but he's now presenting on GB News, so he's banished. I do it with uh, Sarah Vine, Daily Mail, and we used to do it over over Zoom, and you couldn't get, you just couldn't get the interaction. Now we we're back in the studio, hurrah! You know, it, it takes me an hour to get there, an hour to get back. It's so it's longer. Uh, you don't get paid any extra for going in than you did uh, doing at home on Zoom. But it is just better, and it feels better as we do it. And I know if it feels better when we do it, it's going to be better for people watching uh, at home. And it is. You're right. I mean, communication isn't isn't just voice. It is. It is seeing people, and you do have to listen. You pick up. You you spark off uh, each other. Yeah, she's. Yeah. You know, she, her politics are different to mine, but she's. She's very clever, and I'll, right. and I'll pick up. Uh, I probably pick up more more from her than she can from me. But it is, uh, you know, it, it, it would it wouldn't happen in the same way on on, on Zoom. Well, uh, you talked about uh, your old long-standing rivalry with Andrew Tory boy Pierce. Um, is was that rivalry similar to the Sunderland Newcastle rivalry? In football terms, well, what you mean without the violence? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe. I've, I've been to a few hairy, uh, <laughs> weird time derbies in my time. Uh, yeah. It's um, you know, we, well, I've got friends who are Newcastle fans, and you know, most of them, you know, they, they don't like the uh, the taunts about uh, you know, Saudi boys now and the uh, you know, where, where their money's coming from. But you, know, you, you can have a respect and you can, you, know, you can be sensitive about it. I think we're Tory boy. I think where where it's scored, and he's on the right, I'm on the left. He's, he's wrong about just everything I would say. But he's, I think where we, where we sort of connect is because we're both from working class homes and in TV and sadly national newspapers too. That's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rarity. You get a lot of, you know, a lot of people are, Middle class, but fewer from you know genuine working class homes. He's, he's from Swindon. He's adopted parents. His dad worked in a Leyland factory. His mum was a, a packer in a factory. You know, when people used to put things in in boxes, machines will do that now. And I, and I think you know, we both suffered um, snobbery on our you know on our travels. Um, and you kind of got to you know shrug it off, uh, get your own back when you can, because you know never forget, never forgive. But um, I think that just allows us because of that, you know, that that, that shared experience, the background, it, it allow it allows us to, you know, just have a go at each other. And it's you know, some people say, oh, it's like being a friend of me. You know, you're a friend with your enemy. Well, that's true. But we we always uh, yeah we we always thought that you want to make people smile when you're doing the news and let yeah uh, and again you know talking about my mum. My mum would say uh, you want to go to bed at night with a smile on your face because you might die in that night which I <laughs> that's a grim way of doing it but it was you know, just just this just I, this idea that you can you can discuss serious things but you can also sometimes see the absurdity of them yeah. and don't be afraid of, of pointing it out I think the public are crying out for people to at least have civil discourse or I would say humorous civil discourse yeah. Yeah, you can you can you can disagree agreeably. Yeah, and, uh, and you know you, you can do that. I'm not, I'm not saying I always do. I can be disagreeable uh, myself, and sometimes uh, you can you can go in too hard, and you want to win every argument by grinding the other person totally down. So you're triumphant, and you've won. You've made the point, uh, and, and they, they haven't. But um, I kind of see that. You know, I know loads of people with politics are, yeah, that aren't mine and they're good people I sometimes wonder how can you think that how can you, know, you do that if you're an MP but they are you know they're, they're, as individuals they're decent people and we are it's not to say you don't you, know, you don't have to change your view or you know, go soft in an argument but you just gotta 
accept that not everybody who isn't with you is totally against you and somehow evil. <laughs> well, well, they're not. And it, well, I remember one of those arguments because there was a, a, a bit of a mini press hoo-ha, wasn't there, when um, you said uh, the word bollocks um, yeah. uh, and, uh, live on GMTV. And I was like, I was, I was confused about because, you know, I remember the Virgin Records case in 1977 for the Sex Pistols album yeah. that proved that, that, that bollocks was a fine Anglo-Saxon word. Yeah, well, uh, apparently it's not allowed by Ofcom. As it was then read out to me, it's on the. It's not. It's not the most serious. It's not um, like uh, using the f word or the very misogynistic c word, but it is. Uh, it's. It's on the list that you're not. Oh, is it? I yeah. didn't realise it. It was on this because one of my favourite memories was outside uh, uh, the court case. I don't know. I think it was in Manchester, the court case, because it was the Manchester Virgin uh, that had all the Never Mind the Bollocks albums yeah. up in the window. And they interviewed John Lydon, um, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten, as he came out. And they said, Mr. Lydon, Mr. Lydon, what's your view on the verdict of the case? And he just looked at the camera and he went, bollocks is legal. Bollocks, bollocks, bollocks. <laughs> on live television. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I you know, people, I, people I know who wouldn't swear in any conventional uh, so, uh, you know, sense would, would say bollocks, you know, just bollocks, 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 that's it. It's, uh, so I, you know, slightly, uh, it was slightly, I think, I, I think it was Susanna Reid ticked me off. Uh, you know, but of course, if, if I've come, so you can't use it, then she had to, um, and that's it. But anyway, it just drew more attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I loved it, and uh, the, you know, good on you. Yes, you know, bollocks, yeah, yeah, bollocks, bollocks to them. Yeah, that's right. Um, what makes you laugh, Kevin? Uh, I think it's everyday s situations. Normally, I mean, some some people can tell a great story in a, in a, in a good joke, but it is just you know whatever you ju you're just going around your life, uh, and and people will just just point things out. I think that's that's that's. That's what it is. I, I used to work uh, with a guy called Roy Rogers, and yes, he was named after a cowboy. Uh, he, he worked uh, he worked for the Glasgow Herald, and it was in the days I, I was a, a Labour correspondent covering the world work. We used to go to a lot of uh, union conferences, and maybe maybe it was because he was called Roy Rogers that made him very funny. Because of course, every time he said his name, he go oh, 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 and trigger. We were in a, yeah, well, we were in a restaurant on the south coast, and uh, you know, it was all right anyway. And then the uh, you know, the owner came around. I thought, everyone en enjoy. Uh, so, you know, who are you? And somebody said, that's uh, Roy Rogers of the uh, Herald, and the rest of the person, oh, where's Trigger? And Roy just looked down and said, I think I've just eaten it. Right. <laughs> 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 it was, and he, uh, he's not, he's no longer with us, and he, he developed Parkinson's in later life, and it was, it, it's, it's another cruel disease, and it's awful seeing somebody who is so vibrant and you know, full of life being taken by this. But uh, a, a mutual friend stayed at Roy's, uh, Roy's house, uh, and in the, in the, in the morning, um, he could hear Roy coming along the corridor of the room. And he had a teacup in the saucer and you could hear it rattling because of his Parkinson's, you know, it was rattling away. And he knocked, and he knocked on the door and he said, would anyone like half a cup of tea? <laughs> it cost so much of it, I just spilled into the, into, into the saucer. Now, if you've got Parkinson's, I suspect, as he did, you can make a light if, if you can and make that joke. You, know, you, I, you or I could never make that joke because he would then be poking fun at somebody with Parkinson's but he, you know, he, he you know, that was laughing in the face of uh, adversity and trying not to 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 get it that uh, get you get it down and, and it's situations like that but it's it's people around me really I think I I must admit as a journalist we're we're kind of like magpies we <laughs> take things from people and it is just just listening and chatting to people and and they make they make you laugh and then you in turn can make them them laugh, but yeah, it's 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 sparking off others.
Yeah, I, I think that's true. And we talked about Liz Truss and, you know, I think we both agree that leadership is enhanced by laughter. Yeah. But you're you're a great speaker and you're always a great commentator on television. Can you be a, a truly great communicator without humour? Possibly. Possibly. Right. I don't... I don't know if uh, you know, somebody like Steve Jobs <laughs> right, uh, you know, told many, many jokes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, he, he was a very good communicator in his, you know, in his very stylized way. But I think you're a better communicator if you can inject humour at the you know, appropriate humour at the right time. Like, you know, I, I get asked to do a lot of, uh, lot of speeches and, and talks. And, you know, humour at the beginning certainly warms... Uh, it warms up the audience. Doesn't it it uh, helps people relax. You set, uh, you know, you set out your stall. And if you, you, I'm, you know, in the world of politics, if I'm describing politicians, you can just and you tell people things about them that they may not uh, may not know, and the politicians may not want them to know. And I think that uh, you know, I think that really that just really really helps. And you know, sometimes you know, laughter will get you out of a tight spot too. Uh, you know, and somebody's having a, having a go at you. Um, back in the back in the day, uh, the Daily Mirror um, exposed um, John Prescott's affair when he was deputy prime minister with the yeah. Theresa Temple. Um, really, what had happened is, um, and I, I like I like Prezza because he he's fought he's fought his way to the top. But um, his uh, his secretary uh, Tracy Temple it was like you know she kept a diary. With all the uh, lurid details, it was you know like Adrian Moore. Uh, anyway, um, she'd said in her um, sleep, uh, "Nice shag, at DPM, Deputy Prime Minister." That alerted her sleeping boyfriend <laughs> who was next to her. That's uh, something. Uh, something was on. So he looked through a, you know, a stuff, found the diary, and found some pictures of the uh, the other two of them together. And uh, I was tasked, because I knew Preza, of uh, ringing him. Uh, what did he want to, want to comment? And uh, I called him on his mobile, and he was uh, he was at Heathrow. I think it was on the way to Madrid. Didn't go to Madrid in the end. But I said, oh, John, uh, it's uh, Kevin Maguire. Uh, just ringing about your affair with Tracy Temple. I just thought, go straight in. And he didn't say anything uh, for a few moments. So I knew, right, that's it. That's the confirmation because he would you know, come back. And then he kind of tried, he tried to deny it a bit. And I said, look, I'm looking at this photograph. She's unbuttoning your shirt at a party. I mean, yes. and he said, well, Kevin, you've been at parties. What's that proof? I said, well, I don't look at parties like that, John. Uh, I've got another one. You, you're holding her. You've got your hand up uh, her skirt as you're holding her. Because uh, like that. I said, well, you know, there's other people at that party, uh, you know, it could mean anything. I said, all right. Um, and we agreed he'd think about it and come back after uh, 24 hours. He came back, he came with a, a statement, uh, said he regretted it. And it was a huge story. He almost resigned. And I, some ways I feel bad about the story, but another way I can see the public interest when, you know, it's an abuse of power in you know you're the deputy prime minister and it's somebody you employ and then you know, for everyone else in the office anyway uh he had a lot of grief from home uh politically it was 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 difficult for him um a few a few weeks later i was uh in in the house of commons there's a, there's a bit it looks like a cathedral the cloisters just walk i was just walking along and i saw him and I'm like, oh no what do i do i thought all right off Keep on going, sort of brazen it out. Uh, uh, so I go along and I see him, uh, and, he, and he looks at his sort of daggers, and um, I say, "Oh, John, how are you doing?" You know, and he says, "Yeah, come with me, come for, come for a cup of tea." And I went into his office, which had models of the the old ocean going liners. He was a steward yeah. on, which which made me feel, you know, like this is a working class lad who's got to be deputy prime minister's career British success story. And, his affair has been all over the mirror, and I played a role. It's not, you know, not too good. And then he said, um, he said, Kevin, she exaggerated the sex. It was never more than a blowjob. And I, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. And I just sort of laughed, and uh, you know, and then uh, you know, sort of you know, just carried carried on chatting as you know, as if nothing had happened, and, and managed to get out of it. And it's, you know, and it, 
he never had, you know, he never, he never resented it. So, you know, I had perfectly good dealings with him after. And I thought it was like a real caliber of the man. And that yes. kind of got, uh, was, uh, was actually fundamentally decent. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, I'm telling it now and I'm laughing, but I do, I do, I do still feel a bit guilty about going into his, his private life. I think there was a public interest quite clearly, but uh, I still, you know, I've rather done some thieving Tory, <laughs> <laughs> stealing the uh, you know, the church collection or something yeah. like that. But but it's uh, the whole humorology project is is based around that people think humorology is about jokes. It's not. It's about yeah. humility, humanity, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and good humor. And that to me is all those Paul. things. Yeah, Paul. There, there, well, one. If you if you were describing some you know you sort of the person you you'd like to be or you you work with, you'd say good humoured. It will yeah. be somebody who is quite happy and smiley. It doesn't mean they're coming juggling, uh, you know, <laughs> telling you know twenty quick fire gags every, uh, every every hour. It is just somebody who's got a sense of humour and is fun, and you're 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 happier. They're happier. You're, everybody's happier. Yeah, and it's the feel good factor, isn't it? They oh, bring yeah. something into uh, that relationship whereby when you meet up, you go, "Oh, I'm looking forward to this. This will be yeah. fun." Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. The funny thing is, I think "fun's" a word that's gone out uh, of favour. Yeah. And th th there was a study, uh, I think, the University of California, where they found that seventy seven zero point nine percent of people would change supplier. Mm -hmm. based on one criteria and that was if the new supplier was more fun yeah well i could, I could see you've got to deal with somebody and why you know why not uh you know, we, we all want to be happy you, you, you only get one life it's it's short it goes a bit uh, too too quick and <laughs> too swift for some poor souls who uh, you know, I cut, I cut down in their their prime. So so why not have fun? Like if you hear if you hear screaming and shouting, you you put off and you sort of recoil. If you if you hear people laughing, then uh, you know you'll smile and you'll want to you'll want to go and find out what that's about and join in if you can. So no no I th I, just, I really think it is you know let, let's 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 not let's not be you know austere and miserable. Let's let's be fun. That's not to say, uh, you know, like Monty Python and you know the Black Knight, and you, you know, lost your arms and leg, and you see, oh, they're just flesh wounds. Come back, I can, you know, I can still bite you. It's not, it's not quite like that. Yourself. Yeah, but you know, it's you know, it's be it's better if, if, if I think I think fun is part of seeing the glass half full rather than half empty. Oh, I, this has gone so quickly, like you say, all the best things do, but we've reached the point in the show that we like to call quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. So here we go uh, with quick fire questions. Kevin, you've worked in many businesses and many newsrooms and everything. Who's obviously in parliament as well. Who's the funniest business person that you've met? Business person, yeah, mine, my, my, uh, my, my, um, you know, by large um, politicians. One of the funniest, and that people won't won't be you know, won't expect this, I think, is is Gordon Brown had a wonderful sense of uh, humour in in private. He just never wanted to to show it in in public. He wanted to be yeah, you know, like Chancellor, who was the bank manager, as as Prime Minister. He thought you had to be serious, but he he was just funny, and he would tell stories against him himself all the time. He would say when he was young, he was asked to speak for, you know, um, 45 minutes and, uh, and he went on and on and the hall emptied and the only person left at the end, he asked, why are you still here? And they said, well, you know, because um, I'm the next speaker. And, right? and, and it was actually, it turned out he'd been asked to speak for four to five minutes, <laughs> not 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I, don't, I, I didn't expect that. I know that you, um, in your uh, younger days, had a few run-ins uh, with Alistair Campbell. Yeah, um, we, we never really got, we never got along. And, uh, you know, uh, and I quite enjoyed it, really, uh, possibly more than, uh, more than he did. 
that he was now because he when, he when he was working for the Labour Party, Tony Blair and Downing Street, he wanted to control everything. And, and, and I knew Brown, the Brownites. So I knew uh, an, another source of uh, inf information. He's a very smart man. We've had him on the show a couple I'll of say, times. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, he's I, great company. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you'd get you'd, you'd 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 fight then. But um, he's very clever. I think I hear some of his acts of, of kindness for people where you know when they're in trouble are, are very good and publicize them. And he's a great campaigner on on mental health because you know he's he's discussed his own problems and his his battles and that does help other people. It's it's helped change the public perception. Where you know, it used to be used, people used to be embarrassed about it. Uh yeah. and that they wouldn't want to talk about it. And I think, you know. Yeah, good for Campbell on that. I still disagree with him on lots of other stuff. And I'm happy to cross swords, but, you know, respect where it's due. Oh, that's nice. And then, and I, I think that's uh, one of the big things, which probably the Humorology Project is about respect as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and that's, uh, you know, we can find... Uh, it seems to me that you're always looking for the best in people, whoever they are, even a Newcastle fan. Yeah, you, even uh, even my friend, I've got a brother uh, who's a Newcastle fan because he was uh, he was growing up around the time of Supermark, Martin McDonald. Yeah, it drove me dad mad. Um, what book makes you laugh? I'm in a book club. Uh, formed it, I think, in Gilmsby, so seventeen, eighteen years ago. We read a book a book a month. Most of them are pretty pretty grim. It's got to be said. The, the discussions are always a laugh bigger the uh, be a bigger laugh than uh, some of the books. But we we read uh, one book by John Niven called The Second Coming, uh, and it was uh, about God sending you know Jesus to Earth to try and get everyone to be nice. Uh, and he and he sends him down as a musician to enter uh, an American talent contest. And it is it is just beautifully written, and it's kind of sending up TV reality TV. But there is a fantastic passage. This this always makes me laugh when I think about it. Um, where uh, you know God goes down to uh, hell to have a have a word with the the devil, and in the in the bar in hell, the only beer they serve is uh, Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> as somebody who likes real ale, you know, somebody like Timothy Taylor's landlord, fantastic pint. Yeah, Budweiser is you, know, you, you wouldn't pour it down a drain. I mean, it's just it's just terrible. But it is. I'm afraid I've probably killed the passage in a way. But it, it's a really oh. funny book, and that is, you know, it, it's just I just thought it was it was genius. Do you, do you remember the old gag? Now this gag's about thirty years old. What uh, what have um, uh, Budweiser and making love in a canoe got in common. Mm. They're both <laughs> fucking close to water. <laughs> that is very good. <laughs> it's all I had on Budweiser in my head. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Um, what film makes you laugh, Kevin? Uh, I think the funny, the funniest film, and I watch it every Easter. Uh, I got the DVD. Is the life of Brian Monty Python's the life of Brian? Uh, you know, he's not. You know, he's not the Messiah. He's a very naughty boy. Uh, the people's front of Judea. The Judean people's front, which goes front. through all interesting in politics. You can see it. Uh, what have the Romans ever done for us? Uh, that oh. Latin lesson with, by you know John Cleese uh, playing the centurion when there's you know, graffiti being. Written by you know one of the uh, one of the protesters and got it wrong, so he's getting it to write it correctly time after yeah. time. Uh, biggest the stoning, the stoning, yeah. where the stoning, yeah. Yeah. Stoning. Any, stoning, any any women here? I know, oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, and um, <laughs> and the, the right of a man to have uh, have a baby uh, pre uh, pre dates uh, a uh, a debate going on now, which. Uh, you know, is probably the most toxic in uh, in in society. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, and it, but it is pure genius, and every moment is. It... I just love it. I just find it, you know every every time I'm I watch it, I'm just to some extent now anticipating what's coming. But it, it just makes me laugh as much as it did when I when I went to see it very early 80s I was a student in York I remember going and you know some areas were banning it because they you know, it's a, it's a blasphemous and so on but yeah it's, it's just a great it's a great film
Yeah, okay. I love the way that uh, because there was that uh, was it um, the, the um, Dimbleby interview where where I had Palin and Cleese and the Archbishop of Canterbury mm. and um, Malcolm Muggeridge, I think it was oh, yeah. the other person, and uh, I just love the fact that that, that that they were on there and they said, "Have you watched it?" No, yeah. but no, no, that's right. Really in fact, in fact, I'm just I'm just real. Look, I've. Uh, I know other other videos. I've actually bought a copy for a friend, uh, Joe, whose birthday uh, birthday it is, and she said she'd never seen. It. I thought, right, that's it. Get you a copy. Oh uh, God! Oh God! It never seen it. Oh no! That what a treat she's in for then. I, I know, but hey, how old school is that? A DVD rather than uh, streaming? Yeah. Eh? <laughs> you do realise for the next birthday you're going to have to buy her a DVD player. So uh, oh, yeah. oh, actually, I didn't think of that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a very fair point well made. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we talked about things that were dividing society at the moment in that last uh, bit. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question that takes it to the other side. What's not funny? I think, I think, all right, any, anything that's really racist, homophobic, misogynistic, uh, anything that's bullying. You would say it's it's that yeah, it's 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 punching down. I'm I'm all I'm all for you know people having a laugh at work, but not if somebody is always the scapegoat and they you know they suffer as a result uh, and they don't like it. So I think yeah, I think you know you want you want you know you want you want fun and laughter to be you know, people joining in. And you know, there's jokes cracked all the time at work at my expense, but they're not in a nasty, po toxic, poisonous way. Well, I, I think yeah. that's true. I think that that, that humour has to re uh, revolve and yeah. evolve. And, yeah. you know, if you're with your really good mates, at some stage, you need to be the butt of the joke and yes. just take your, put your hands up in order for it not to be oh. bullying and then somebody else yeah. is the butt of it and so, so we all take off you know the classic take your turn in the barrel you know yeah well you, you know that you, you hear it like uh, he she can can give it but can't take it and uh, they they dish it out it comes back all of a sudden they're incredibly precious so it's, it's got to, it's got to be two-way uh, she they can't take it uh, yes yeah yeah I, uh, <laughs> did, did, I, did i did i not say that i mean like, <laughs> Yeah, whoever we can lose whoever, that in the edit. Whoever, yeah, they, they. I should have just if I just say they, it can be everybody. Can't yeah. <laughs> and, and I, and I wouldn't want to exclude anybody. Uh, people, but uh, uh, people who, anyway, I'm, I'm sort of digging. I'm going to get out of the car <laughs> of the GSEB and walk away now. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, what uh, word makes you laugh? You're a journalist. There must be words that always tickle you. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm afraid it's. Um, I'm sort of blushing. It's. It's probably uh, just terrible schoolboy humour that's never quite gone. But it, but I can't, you know, without sort of uh, sort of uh, laughing. Uh, hear the word uh, moist. <laughs> I don't know. It's just. I'm, yeah, it's quite what I'm thinking. I don't know. But um, <laughs> no. But it's they, just a it, funny word. It, it, yeah. it is. I don't, I don't think it's. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's used <laughs> uh, used very professionally and coldly in cooking or something. But anyway, most people, but most people I I know who when they use my say it deliberately because to, to get a laugh anyway. But I'm no, not. No. Um, what sound makes you laugh? I mean, laughter itself, which is yeah. uh, is is a great it's a great sound. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, th I think. I think that's that's it. It's probably it's, pro it's probably laughter rather than you know. I'm glad to say uh, somebody somebody screaming for their life doesn't make me laugh. Or uh, <laughs> no. terror or dog savaging somebody. I don't, I don't laugh at any of that. But I think no. it's you know, it's it's all real you know, it's, laughter. Yeah, it's, it's well, it's coming back to that good humour and just people, you know, having Wait, having you... fun. You know, that three letter word. Fun. I'm interested because obviously we're both football fans and we go to the football. We don't just watch it on television mm -hmm. and everything. I, I still think that, you know, I don't know why it's still funny, but my son and I sit there and we all still laugh when everybody, the goalkeeper's about to kick it and they go, yeah. 
know, know and it's, know, I, it's I, ridiculous. I, it's it's a pantomime, isn't that's it? Yeah, you, know. you know that's yeah. uh, you know Wimbledon where you know we're up where I go as well with my mates. You know the you know with with the uh, you know we we sit to uh, you know, Jazza Jonathan and Ian. You sit there and you like it. And we used to be near a bloke who would just shout all the time, "You Muppet," and he became known as the Muppet Man, right? And we'd all just be waiting for him to shout Muppet. And actually, he's a really nice guy, quite a big, tall guy. It does a lot for the club, uh, takes his, you know, kid, you know he's, he's sort of a gentle giant, but he did he used to shout Muppet all the time. Since the, since the shifting ground, we don't sit near him anymore, so we don't hear it. We miss it. We yeah. miss it. We still, we still well, wait for the, the shout of Muppet. Yeah, Muppet. Well, isn't it funny? Because we got seats at the new ground, and they're not the best seats, and we could get much better seats in higher places but we love there's 10 people behind us who we absolutely adore because they're they're so funny they're, they're from really disparate backgrounds and they're you know and it's like a family and we've created and even when the football's shite which sometimes let's be honest it really is you still have a fantastic time because of the people you're with yeah you know when uh when COVID came along, I, uh, I bumped into a bloke I used to see at Sunderland Games, lived in London, uh, like me. And he said, I haven't been in the football. And I've realised what I miss isn't not the football, but it's the camaraderie and the social side. And and you're right, there's a uh, a lad, uh, Eamon, sits near us. He was a former uh, school head. He's retired now. Uh, Left-wing Brexiteer. Uh, and he would uh, yeah, he'd, he'd bring in pamphlets and wave them at me. <laughs> and I, uh, to taunt me, and I, you know, I just point out what a mess he's made of the country. Uh, but it is—it just—you're right. It's people. It's people around you. That's what it's—you uh, know—that's about. And I, I always feel for anybody who who sits next to really aggressive, hostile people, yeah. because while others can make the atmosphere with you, and you, you can enjoy it, and you know, and you you go with your lad. It's a you know, it's a, it's bonding, isn't it? Without you know, oh, fantastic bonding. Without, yeah. You know, without forcing it. Uh, but anyone, you know, you can just as people can make a much happier and fun experience, others can make it less fun and and, and happy. Thankfully, now there's a lot less. Um, you know, you very rarely hear naked uh, homophobia or, or, or racism. Back in the day, we did. That's yeah. that's gone. That's oh not God, safe. I remember. Yeah, it's I not remember. eradicated entirely, but it's. Uh, right. I went to a rather rough school where the leader of the Chelsea shed went as well. And so he was all yeah. right with me because yeah. I went to primary school with him as well. And yeah. so I kind of was, you know, all right, Billy, you know, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, well, yeah, you're as good as gold, but yeah, he would take his shirt off. It was the fat man. Mm. You, you remember he was called the fat man at leader of the Chelsea shed. It got in the papers quite a lot. Yeah, Newcastle United had a lad who did that. I mean, who ate all the pies? I mean, absolutely amazing. He's showing off his, you know, what's the beat? 25 stones. Yeah, the real, yeah. you know, sort of 30, yeah. Yeah, 38 double D. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got into trouble for uh, on GMTV, didn't you? For uh, um, With Ed Balls for saying it. It doesn't uh, look like you've seen a salad in a while. And uh, we were discussing food. I was accused of fat shaming him. Um, <laughs> I've known I've known Ed Balls for donkey's years, decades. Uh, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've been a football with him. You know all, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. That's why I felt I could say it. Yeah, because it's, it, it's a big it, thing to say, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He is. You know, he's a he's a great. Who he's just you know, he's, he's me mum would say he's big boned. Uh, <laughs> well, it's. He, uh, I... Um, who's it? Phil Jupitus, who used to work. You remember Phil Jupitus? Yes, um, yeah. They, uh, Phil Jupitus used to have a line in the early days of the comedy store. He said, Don't go thinking I'm fat. It's just, I'm just big boned, mm. big fat, wobbly bones. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. I think we're quite, we're quite rightly more sensitive, uh, uh about people's, people's, people's weight. Uh, and I, you know, one, if, I don't know. 10, 15 years, wherever ago, I, I've not, I don't think anything of describing a politician, somebody like Eric Pickles, who was a, a, a Tory cabinet minister, is in the Lords. He's a big yeah. lad. Um, yeah. It was Cameron or Osborne once made a joke uh, at his expense saying, uh, 
that Eric Pickles could be seen from the space station. And he, I discovered he really, he really didn't like it. And it was kind of thought, well, if he really doesn't like it, uh, and he's se he's sensitive about it. Um, is it is it right to use it? Because there's a lot, of, you know, there's a lot of political reasons to to criticise him. And uh, and I think there's there's been a, a greater realization. People, uh, it's 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 not it's not particularly pleasant to go on about their weight. But but with Ed, I knew he wouldn't be hurt uh, because he's he's a mate and he knows. And you'll just you know discuss these things in the past. But no, but to People on the outside who are, well, are looking in, they you know they, they rallied they rallied to his side, and you know, I thought fair enough. You know, they, they kind of don't know the background, but you know it's 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 reasonable to uh, you know to be protective. Yeah. Probably yeah, better no. piling in on my side than they all. You know, remember that um, what what was um, Churchill's grand great grandson's name, who is in, who now in the House of Lords, who was. Um, yeah, I got, no, I don't. I wish you. Yeah, I can see him. He was a Sussex MP. Uh, yes. Oh God, he's lost a lot of weight now. I don't think he's been in the best of health. I can oh, see him. He's the one who used to shout. Uh, was alleged to have shouted uh, to John Prescott. Uh, I know we discussed earlier being aware he would shout across the House of Commons, Giovanni, get me a, a gin and tonic. Which Prescott did not uh, like. Um, As a steward on these ships. Yeah, yeah a, a former girlfriend of his, the, this Tory is, once said uh, making love with him was like having a, a large wardrobe fall on top of you with a key sticking out. <laughs> That's the um, bit I loved was was the fact yeah. that the key sticking out was, I thought, the, the dagger to the heart. It is. Nicholas Soames. Nicholas Soames. Oh. There you go. Yeah. Oh. Thank God. We were, they were there. God, just before the end of the show. We got there. I, I know, people. I know, I know, I know. I know. Your mum would be proud um, at 92. She, <laughs> no, I'm not 92. She's like, yeah, like yours. You know, she'd be proud I got there in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, penultimate question. Um, you uh, got your degree at Hull. You are now... Um, York. As yeah. a, York, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you are now a visiting professor at uh university of sunderland is that yeah, correct yeah and you've gone back so you're obviously um intelligent would you rather be considered clever or funny uh, mm, uh can i have both no uh, <laughs> i probably the truth is i'll get i'll get i'll get none but uh, you know um <laughs> i think it's quite interesting i think i think actually clever right because if you're, hmm, or should I go for funny? Because I think you've got to be clever to be funny. I don't, I don't, ah, I think it's I a, th a sharpness. And, you know, I, I know loads of funny people never went to university, left school at 16. They just missed out on formal education, but they're very clever. And they're, yeah. and they're funny. I'm right, I'm, I'd say I'm going for funny, because if you're funny, you've got to be clever. Well, you could be funny and you may not be, sorry, yeah, if, you, if, if you're clever, it doesn't mean you're funny. But if you're funny, you've got to be clever. So I'm going to go for funny, then I do get both. Yeah, I know. I think you've come up with a very persuasive argument, which I completely agree with, that I don't know any funny people who aren't smart as well. No, Because no, you have no. to. The brain has to work yeah. in that way in, yeah. in order to, you know, the synapses have to work really quickly. So yeah. they are generally very, very bright. Mm -hmm. And finally, Kevin, desert island gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is yeah. it? Um, it's a it's a Ricky Gervais joke, which always makes me me laugh, and I and I love it when I find people who've who've never heard it, so I can tell them. And he, he, he it in a nutshell, it's uh, who says prison doesn't work. Uh, look at Nelson Mandela, did twenty seven years inside, came out never reoffended, right? <laughs> and, he, and of course, yeah, I just. I just love it. I just love that that idea. I'm sure Nelson Mandela himself would laugh, <laughs> would have laughed uh, at it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and Nelson Mandela is such a fantastic uh, human being, probably as as close to a saint as we'll, uh, you know, we're, we're likely to, uh, to to see how he handled himself at uh, in incarceration for so uh, for so long. And I, and I know Gervais was a great admirer of. Uh, of Mandela, but um, it's done you... with love and it embodies yeah. the man. Yeah. And you can't do that gag unless you think that the guy would think it is funny. And it is, 
Yeah, there was a there was a Labour MP called Frank Dobson. He was uh, briefly yeah. health sec health secretary. Uh, he'd been very big in the anti apartheid movement. When Nelson Mandela was free and his first trip to London, he he asked to see Frank Dobson, known of his uh, work. He wanted a one on one, and Frank Dobson couldn't believe it. Went to South Africa House where he used to protest outside. Uh, went in. Uh, he's, he's taken to the room, and he says he's taken into this room, and Nelson Mandela is sitting at uh, you know uh, at a desk, and he's just got like a private secretary with him. Frank Dobson said he just stopped and has you know hesitating thinking I'm with Nelson Mandela and it was just you know just that little delay and Mandela said Frank what's the matter don't you recognize me that is brilliant <laughs> uh, Dobson, who could tell a uh, fantastic dirty joke I can't remember anything but totally unusable uh, but he, oh. had a, he, he had a heart of gold and a, and a, a, a mouth of dirt. You know? <laughs> oh, no, that is fantastic. Yeah. And we got two Desert Island gags for the price of one. Oh, so, yeah. um, Kevin Maguire, thank you so much for being so much fun and, and being so fabulous on the Humorology podcast. I really appreciate your time. But, uh, Paul, Paul, it's been a, a pleasure and uh, dare I say it's an honour. Thank you. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros. Produced by David Rose. Music by Steve Hayworth. Creative direction by Les Hughes. And additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.